Marshall went to the other. Why don't we just do, can we do the, let's do the third verse, chorus a cappella, and then we'll come back in here and then do chorus a cappella. With the piano. Okay? Because it's a little more of a, um, this is a more contemplative verse, verse three, and I think it'd be good to do the a cappella and then we'll come back in with the, you know, strong and then we'll do the throw. Okay? And then we should be able to just go seamlessly. I mean, I can just start the next song, right? You know. um. In your everlasting ways, I will sing your song. All right. <clears throat> and then at the end of this one. This one, we have to repeat that here after this. Should be good. All right. Your phone's still plugged in, but... <clears throat> well, good morning. Good to see you folks with us on this Sunday morning. I'm going to invite you to stand with us, if you would, please, and sing out, calling one another to worship this morning. Come behold the wondrous mystery as we rejoice and rem remind ourselves of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come behold. <clears throat> Sing it out together. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to
remain standing for our responsive reading today from Romans chapter 4. We'll read two excerpts from Romans 4, verses 1 through 8 and verses 13 through 16. Joe Hoffman's going to lead us in our responsive reading today. Thank you. This is God's word. Infallible, inerrant. It's the truth as we start reading. What shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is his father of us all. Amen. You can be seated. Hopefully you already sang with us. We did responsive read on purpose so that you read scripture with us together. And I'm going to pray in just a minute, and my hope is that you pray with me, which means you are praying as I pray. You're agreeing with what I say to God. This is on purpose. We're not asking you to come just to be a spectator and sit and observe. You could do that on your couch without having to get dressed and come into a service. To be here means we participate together to worship our God together. And so let's pray together. I'll pray in just a moment, but I want to give you a moment to pray on your own, and then we'll pray together. I do that because I know we, man, you come in, you fight the kids to get in here, you're looking at the clock, you're thinking about the rest of the day. We want to be very intentional with what we do here. We've set aside this time to worship our God. So would you take a moment to pray to that God, to thank him for this moment, to pray his working in your life today through the word, through the spirit? That this would be a time where you are strengthened, where God is glorified. Would you pray? And in just a moment, I will begin praying for us as a church body. Let's pray. Father God, there is nothing that we have accomplished, figured out, checked off a spiritual list that allows us to come to you right now. It's not because of us. Our only hope in coming to you right now is that you are a gracious God. And it would give us faith to trust in Jesus Christ's death upon the cross. In this moment as we come, we rest on grace. We we thank you that we can rest on grace because you are a gracious God. That's who you are, God, and we praise you for it. 
you have not and you will not give us what we deserve. You graciously made us your child. You free us from the penalty of sin. You bless us. Father, your gracious blessing, it fills our life. It is, it is your gracious blessing upon us that we get to gather together with other Christians today. We get to do it in safety today. We, we actually get to do it in comfort today. It is gracious that we have the ability to even be here today. God, as we praise you for your grace, as we rest upon your grace, Father, we have to confess that although we are recipients of grace, we live like we've earned it sometimes. We are prideful of accomplishments we think we've accomplished, even though you're the one that does it. We complain when we don't have what we want even though what we deserve is not what we have. We are judgmental of others, even though our standing is because of grace. Father, we pray we would see that everything we have, everything that we are, is because of who you are as our gracious God. Father, this grace we pray, we pray for our country, our community, our leaders in need of grace. We pray that we would see your saving grace run through our community. That it would save individuals, open eyes. Father, for our church family, we pray. And we take that same prayer of grace to our church family. We pray that you would graciously provide for needs of our church body. Whether that means as a church as a whole, the needs we have to minister the gospel to this community. Or that we graciously provide for individual needs of those that walk in today. Father, there are some in our church family that their, their needs go unseen. They walk in with emotional, spiritual, relational needs that, that aren't known to the person next to them. Father, as they wrestle with hurts and questions, I, pr pr I pray that they would be encouraged today, strengthened today by who you are in their life. That the Ephesians will challenge them to see in their life that they are your workmanship, a gracious work that you are doing. Some of our, our needs in our body are more they're, they're more public. There are physical weaknesses. There's ongoing sickness with some. That there's real struggle as our bodies break down. But the, the prayer is still the same for like Ron and Margie Tischer, Lou Allen, Jim and Nancy Schwarzendrupper. There, there's still a need that they would rest in grace today. The grace of Jesus Christ would bring them joy today even if there's pain that they're experiencing Father, we thank you that your work, your work is throughout all your creation. And we thank you that we have been able to partner with, with individuals working for your work in different parts of this world that we, we, we aren't at. And so we pray for Caleb and Echo Stein today ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ in Peru. I pray, Father, as they proclaim the gospel, the gracious message of Jesus Christ dying for sins, that that would bear fruit. It would transform individuals as they invest into a college setting. Would individuals that are trained there be equipped to go throughout all that region ministering for you? As they pour out ministry, Father, I pray that there is ministry being poured into them. Encouragement of your word being poured into them. Father, we end here then. We've already sung. We've already gone to your word. And we're going to keep on doing the same thing for the next hour or so. Because it's your word that we need. 
And we pray, it's, we pray it's praise we desire to give to you. Would you work within your church today? Would you do it through your word today? And would you do it for your glory today? In Jesus' name we pray these things. And God's people say... Let's stand together again as we lift our voices. God of grace, amazing wonder, so immeasurable and free. Lift your voices as we sing of God's great grace. After we sing God's God of grace, we'll sing Jesus paid it all and then may the mind of Christ my Savior.
Ephesians, please. Ephesians chapter number 2. In our culture, what we're going to about to do now is, is rather odd. To think that we are going to set aside now, I'm not going to tell you how long, okay, because you're going to be like, oh, that, that long? We're going to set aside an amount of time in which there are no special effects, no multiple speakers. In fact, you're not even going to be able to engage other than to just listen. You can't flip the channel. It's really odd. And yet we're going to do it emphatically. Because the word we just opened, I hope you just opened, is our only hope of truth. It's our only means to know how to change. It is our means to hear from God today. And even though God's word calls it foolishness, preaching, it is the foolishness of preaching that God uses to work his will and word. So, with that in mind, let's look to God's word. Ephesians 2, let me read three verses this morning. Verse 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift from God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. And so, God, now because we opened up your word, and as a church body we are your people, it is only fitting that we pray to you. Because what we desire is your word to work in our life. We need your spirit to open up eyes, to make us understand, to convict, to comfort. So that your glory would be realized. Would you work? In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Kids, I don't know if I've, I've, I've put out my opinion on this one before, kids, but my opinion, and you can fight me on this one, but I think most of us kids would, we would agree with this one. Legos are like the single greatest toy ever invented. I mean, maybe the ball's up there somewhere, but Legos are like, they are such an ingenious invention. You, Lego claims if you have six of their most basic two-by-four brick. And I just lost some of you, okay, okay. Um, I'm sorry for your childhood, okay. Their most basic two-by-four brick. If you have six of those, you can make 102 million different combinations with those six bricks. I didn't do the math, okay. So just take Lego's word for it. But the, the beauty of Legos is you can just have a pile of bricks and make whatever you want. In our family, we have what we call the, uh, the junk bin, the junkyard of Legos. It's all the Legos that, that, that aren't assigned to another set right now or being used right now. And so we just have this big old Tupperware container of just Lego junkyard stuff. And it's amazing. My kids can just get engrossed in a bunch of random pieces of plastic. I mean, there are times where, where my three-year-older will, will run up to me and he has he is just gotten lost in a little world of, of 12, 20 Lego blocks, putting them together, and he'll come up proudly and show me his masterpiece of Lego creation. And I'll say, so what is it? And he'll look at me dumbfounded, like, how don't you know what this is? It's a spaceship, Dad. See, those blocks there are the rocket. That makes it go fast. That's very important. And that block there is the gun. That, that's very important, too. And then the last thing's like, so where's the seat? Uh, I, yeah, that, that's a spaceship, Dad. But we got a plan. There are times where my kids are bored, and I'll walk into the room, and there's this bin of junkyard Legos, and they're aimlessly putting some blocks together, and I'll ask them, so, so what are you making? And you will get the, the most famous answer from kids. I don't know. What, what do you think it will be when you're done? I don't know. What do you think it's going to do? I don't know. Nothing. 
Maybe. Wow, have, have fun with that. Okay, two completely different plans of building. Which one characterizes God's work in your life, Christian, to make you what you are today? Which one? Now, I know the impulse answer, and I think you, you can see it. Like, oh, there, there's, evidently God has plan and purpose and design, and he has aim, and there's, a, there's purpose in each one of the bricks he puts into my life. And he's like, yes, I, that's the first one. But I ask the question because I am convinced that sometimes we don't think that way about God in our life. I already read it, but I want to highlight it and go back to it. Verse number 10, one phrase. We'll unpack the whole passage through this one phrase. For we, Christian, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, purpose statement, for good works. Christian, he just called you his workmanship. We'll unpack that word, but he just called you his, his, his work of art, his masterpiece. We don't always feel that way. His junk, maybe. God's afterthoughts of spare parts. Maybe God's just aimless doodlings. <laughs> no, we're actually his workmanship. We're the master plan of God putting things together to make us brand new. And he has a purpose for it all. He, he has a unique purpose for us as Christians that he's made us for something. And again, I push this because I'm not convinced that, well, our lives don't always show that we believe we were actually made for a purpose. Very simply, Christian, you were made for a purpose. God did something in your life for a purpose. Let's take that statement and break it down to two statements, little bite-sized pieces for us. God made us. Now, I'm not using that statement, God made us, as in you're going all the way back to like Genesis and creation, or like God formed me in my mother's womb. That's not where I'm going. God made us spiritually new creation. God made us. It was his work. Look down at verse number eight. He's going to say the same thing in verses number eight and number nine about, about five different times in a matter of a few lines. He's going to just beat the same truth over and over again into our thick heads. And he needs to. Because every generation that comes along twists this ever so slightly and destroys this statement. Verse number eight. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. Got it? That was pretty simple, wasn't it? For by grace, you've been saved through faith, period. Done. Two elements. God's grace, faith. Got it. Salvation is by God's gracious work in my life to save me. God is the one that saves. And actually, that's not a surprise in the passage. If you knew nothing else but Ephesians 2, Paul's already said this a few times. Look back up in verse number 5. This is where he's just, he's just kind of beating this around here. Verse 5, by grace, you've been saved. He does it in a slightly different way in verse number 7. The immeasurable greatness of his grace, the immeasurable riches of his grace in Christ Jesus. This is all about grace. So then he gets to the third time now, and he says it in verse number 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith. Got it. Can we all just nod our heads? Got it. Third time's the charm. He's not done. This is where just like, we, we, we got it, Paul. We, we really got it. No, no, I don't think you have it. Because he, he says one side, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And then he says the exact same truth just on the flip side. It's, it's, it's the other side of the same coin. Look how it keeps on going then. For by grace you've been saved through faith. What does that mean? And this is not your doing. 
You didn't have anything to do with it. It wasn't, it, it wasn't you. You know that moment at work where like you have worked on a project for 12 weeks straight and you put in overtime on this project and you finally brought it to completion and you're presenting it to the boss and then coworker Bill, whoever that is, walks in and starts taking credit for your work. And you just want to shout, you didn't have anything to do with this, Bill. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't do this. It's my, it's my work. Okay, that's what God just did here. I saved you by grace through faith. Just, by, just make it clear, you didn't do it. So now we think we got it. Well, evidently Paul's not convinced we have it yet. Because he keeps on going. It is the gift of God. Well, Paul, I think we covered that one already when you said it was like by grace. That's, that's gift. Not a result of works. Do you see how Paul, I mean, he is literally just saying the same thing over and over and now over again. You're standing with God. Salvation from the penalty of sin is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, period. And we nod, and he says, by the way, so that means you didn't do it. And we nod, and he says, by the way, that means it's a gift from God. He's just giving it. And we say, yeah. And he says, and by the way, that means no works. I think there's actually, there's some reason here that he's doing it this way. If you look at the sequence, he makes the statement, so you're saved by grace through faith. And we nod. But just to make sure that we don't think that faith is something that we kind of like, well, that's our 50% that we bring to salvation and God does the grace part and that's 50% that he brings. He says, no, 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 no. The faith, God does that too. It's God. As simple as those, I don't know, four minutes of talk was, Generation and generation after people have struggled with those, with that statement. And some of you grew up in a culture where you attempted to get saved, and you call what you want. You attempted to get saved. You called. You, you attempted to be right with God. You, you attempted to make it to heaven, and you did it through a whole bunch of religious rituals. You went to confession, confirmation, communion, baptism, prayers, beads, candles, church attendance. That was our Wisconsin culture. If in God's sovereignty you grew up, grew up in another place, it would have looked a little bit differently. Maybe, maybe it would have looked like pulling out a mat and facing towards a certain city and praying five times a day so you could be right with God. And this salvation is not your doing. It's not a result of works. But this whole push back where somehow in my thinking, I need to bring something to the table for God to save me. Like I, 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 I got to meet him halfway or, or at least a little portion of this way. And that thinking still seeps into church after church, no matter what name you put on the outside of it. Takes all forms. Attempting to get saved by showing works of let me give my lot of money. I'm super charitable. And this salvation is not your own doing. It's not a result of works. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that. But like I have all, I know so much about the Bible, Pastor. Like I can explain to you the Trinity and I can defend literal creation in Genesis 1 and 2 and I know all about a virgin birth and I can even explain to you the gospel. I know, I've figured this all out. And this salvation is not your doing. It is not based on works. Yeah, I, but, but Pastor, like I, I rose my, raised my hand. I, I walked an aisle. I prayed what they told me to pray. And this salvation is not by your own doing. It is not by works. This point is made over and over again in the New Testament. Galatians 2. We know that a person is not justified, is not made right with God by the works of the law. Romans 3. 
For by the works of the law, by doing what is right, by checking things off spiritually, no one, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness that we have done. And this salvation is not your doing. It's not by works. Salvation is only through God's precious gift of faith, of trusting in Jesus Christ's death upon the cross as our only payment for our sins. It's by grace. It's by grace through the means of faith, not anything that I accomplish, but a belief in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord as I turn from my sin and I put my faith in Jesus Christ alone, period. And we take all our religious tradition and baggage and we confuse it and we heap it up on top. And we ruin the statement. Church, for, for, for centuries now, the simple statement of salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we've beaten this over and over again because so easily we like to tweak it I bring up my littlest several times, A, because he's not in the room right now. So he doesn't know I'm doing this, okay? But B, God's blessed him with an amazing personality. A lot of spunk. Doesn't always show it here, which is, which is probably a good thing. There are plenty of times in conversation where, where as dad, I will give instructions of what needs to happen, okay? And then my youngest has this impulse right now, yeah, but. And I don't care what he puts in the yeah, but. It's his little push of saying, I want to kind of massage this to be kind of a little bit more what I want. So, so, Lincoln, you need to go do this, this, and this. Yeah, but, but, but what about this? No, 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 no. Lincoln, this, this, and this. Yes, Dad. Yeah, but, but. Okay, we do this with God. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Yes, but. Isn't it great? I've also done this, this, and this, and this. It's probably made it a little bit better. No. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Y yeah, but I mean, I've been, whew, I'm kind of spiritual. No. Our pride puts out these yeah, but statements over and over again. Because there's so much of us that we feel like somehow we got to bring something to this table. It's a gift from God, not of works. Purpose statement now, so you can't boast. There is nothing in this gospel that allows us to pat ourselves on the back. To puff out our chest and say, look what we just did. If this is by grace, through faith, not of ourselves, it is a gift, then boasting about what we have in God through Jesus Christ sounds as foolish as the water boy boasting about the game-winning shot as he spits in the whole game sitting at the end of his bench. You didn't, you didn't do anything about this. No offense to those who were like cheerleaders back in the day. When I played sports, I struggled with the cheerleaders, okay? I, they're fine, be there, cheer. But when the game gets done, you don't get to take credit for it, okay? Like, all you did was wave pom-poms and yell, okay? You didn't score any points. You didn't, you didn't even help us in practice. You don't get a boast about this one. Christian, we didn't even cheer God on when he paid the penalty for our sin. We don't get a boast. I had, I had several passages I wanted to show now, but I just I cut out a whole bunch. So we, we got work to do today. The church of Corinth, I think, really struggled with this whole boasting concept. There's about four different passages in the book of 1 Corinthians where Paul just says, you, you don't get to do this. You don't get a boast. He starts the book, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. 
Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were noble birth. He's just like, guys, you were nothing. Like, you, you, you weren't anything to brag about to start with. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring nothing the things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you were in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that as it is written, let no one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Church, we, you don't get to pat yourself on the back for this. It is God's working. God made us. Now this statement that I've been saying, God made us, is not just simply God made us salvation. I want to take it one step further. Because there's a word that we've already introduced at the beginning, from verse number 10, that goes into the picture of what it means for God to make us. God to make us a new child. God to save us. But before we go to that word, just consider this statement then. Salvation is by grace. God made us. Is that a grace you know? Or are you still attempting to be right with God with your yeah, but? What about this, God? Yeah, yeah, but I, I did that too, God. No. Today I am right with God simply because God has graciously paid for the penalty of my sin by Jesus Christ's death upon the cross in place of my payment that I respond to by turning from my sin and believing in Jesus Christ only. That is my hope. No, yeah, but, no, I've also done this. That's it. Do you know that grace? Have you received that gift? If you have, then there's, there's a, a phrase that's saying this is what God's doing in your life. Verse number 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So this is not like your physical body. To be in Jesus Christ is spiritual. So this is your spiritual life. Your spiritual life is God's workmanship. Now that word workmanship is the word creation, created, but, but it's often used to describe um, an artist with a work of art, a master craftsman forming a new piece. It is, it is workmanship is the word that can be translated masterpiece, work of art. It's, it's used of the potter with the wheel spinning with the clay and they move their fingers ever so slightly to form exactly the kind of pot they are looking for in vessel. It's, it's the word used over and over again of, of, of writers, poets, crafting words and phrases and looking for the exact right word to fit in that poem to make it work and make it just sing with beauty. It's used of, of woodworkers as they, as they chip away at pieces of wood and craft a new creation out of a chunk of wood. Christian, you are God's workmanship. It just said that God, in his sovereign wisdom and care, made something brand new out of you formed you, chipped away at parts, took brush strokes, and made a masterpiece. To say, Christian, that you are God's workmanship communicates design, beauty, value. But not design and beauty and value that gets you to make you like, hey, look at me, like God did something pretty cool with me. Because you didn't do it. God did. You are by God's working an epic poem far better than any Emily Dickinson produced. Which doesn't say much because I'm not a big fan of Emily Dickinson, okay. You are his workmanship. More epic than Homer's Odyssey. You, you are his workmanship. 
You are his masterpiece, his handiwork. You who are apathetic to God's working in your life, the picture that God is somehow distant from you in heaven, kind of shrugging his shoulders about your life, thinking, I don't know what I'm doing down there with him. (laughs) I don't care. You are his workmanship. Far more, than, far more than all the stars in the sky, far more than a towering peak of a mountain, the crashing waves, or a perfectly painted sunset, you are God's workmanship. Because in you, God has created an eternal soul. Everything else I just mentioned, he's going to obliterate when he makes a new heaven and a new earth. But your soul will remain And not just that he's made a soul out of you, he has then redeemed you as his child, made you a brand new creation in Jesus Christ so that you can spend eternity with him, giving him praise and glory. You are his masterpiece of creation. And it was a workmanship to bring it about. This is what we've been doing for 33 verses. It's like, Pastor, we've been at this all year. Yeah, 33 verses, okay? Good ground covered. But this is what Ephesians 1 through this point has been talking about. It is painting a picture of God, the, the, the master craftsman, making a plan from eternity past to say, this is how I'm going to redeem individuals. And then providing for that through the suffering of Jesus Christ upon the cross. And then bringing faith into our life and redeeming us as his child and making us brand new. And then Paul gets to the and says, you are his handiwork. Don't you see what God has poured out into your life? believers you are not some afterthought God isn't aimlessly putting Lego blocks together in your life and saying I don't know (laughs) we'll see what comes of this thing don't belittle God's working in your life like God doesn't care about you that you are nothing more than a duct taped together pile of junk by God. Are you finished? No. Do you still mess up? Yeah. But don't discount God's merciful and gracious working in your life. You are God's workmanship. I... I enjoy woodworking. Um, the last few years, I've kind of gotten into it more and more. I don't have all the tools to really make, and maybe all the patience, to make really good pieces of furniture. But I still enjoy the process. In my house, there's a dining room table. There's a, a hallway, um, coat tree. Uh, in my office, there's a desk. But they're all, um, they're all imperfect. Um, in fact, this morning I sat at my desk thinking, oh man, i got to fix these cracks and I don't want to make it worse. Th- they're by no means heirloom pieces of furniture yet. My dad, on the other hand, um, my dad is really good. Maybe one step below kind of like really, really good. And so I have a few pieces in my house and my office that were made by my dad. Now when my dad makes a piece, because it is so, I think, just good, he wants to take credit for it. And there's a little bit of healthy pride, like, this was pretty nice. I want people to know I made it. He will take um, uh, an engraved piece of metal, and he'll heat that piece of metal up and stamp every one of his pieces of furniture with a statement. I have it on my, on my coat tree in my office. There's a burnt-in statement on the bottom, handcrafted by Steve Love. There's a certain amount of pride with that statement. Like, I made that. And it's a nice piece. I kind of helped with it, by the way, okay? I mean, I, I held the, 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 the pieces of wood as they went through the table saw, so I can take some credit for it. Not, not really. It's made by Steve Love. That word handcrafted is designed, it's cared for, it's chipped away, it's sanded down. It is done by the bare hands of Steve Love to make this piece of furniture. Christian, not to puff you up, not to pat you on the back, But please realize your identity in Jesus Christ. You are supernaturally made by God himself. 
to be what you are today, a child of God. And I stress this point, but so, so easily we, we fall into this trap of thinking that somehow God does not care what I am right now. So easily fall into this trap of thinking that somehow God has made a mistake with me. You are his handiwork. You are the product of eternity past plans made by God. To provide for payment for your sin. To breathe new life into you to open your eyes so that he can have a relationship with you and make you brand new. Don't cheapen what God has done in your life by somehow shrugging it off like God does not care. Like God somehow would have forgotten about you. You are his masterpiece work of art. Now, he's not just doing this aimlessly for no purpose. God made us his own for the purpose of good works. Verse number 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. For good works. All of this he's doing, all this, this master work, all this forming, all this creating, all this Jesus Christ for us as a purpose. He's, he's working towards something. And he just said it in verse number 10. He's working towards us being made for good works. Now don't push back with me. Some of you are like, well, Pastor, you just spent like, I don't know, 10 minutes of your first part of your sermon saying, it's not about good works. It's not about good works. Not by works we've done. Amen. Good works to earn God's favor, to earn God's favor are nothing more than filthy rags. Good, good works to earn God's favor is nothing more than, than dumping a few pennies into an ever-growing multi-billion dollars worth of debt of sin before God. But... Good works that flow out naturally out of a supernaturally changed heart through Jesus Christ are glorifying to God. We are saved for a purpose, Christian. We were made for a purpose. For good works. Church, You were not made a child of God to go about living an apathetic, serve yourself life. Christian, you were not made for going back to life that you had before salvation. Think about that. I honestly think we we fall into this trap, I think it's no big deal. Why would God go through all the pains? of planning and providing for your salvation to bring you into a relationship with you just so that you can go back to exactly the way you were. That's not the purpose. You were saved not to do life normally like the world does it. You were saved for a radically transformed life that would be a radiant testimony of God's love to the world around you as you poured out God's love. You were saved for a purpose. You weren't saved simply to get out of hell. You weren't saved simply to get to heaven for eternity. You were saved for a purpose. To be a new creation made by God. To glorify him through your life lived for him. You were saved for a purpose. How are we doing on that purpose? Now I know I want to unpack this. Because I made this statement, you were saved for good works. And and we've done a lot of damage with that statement. I'm not talking about salvation and how we get saved, but we've already covered that. We've, We've done a lot of damage in churches by how we think about good works. See, because at times what we simply say is we need to, we need to, we've been saved for good works, then some of us think, okay. I hear you, Pastor. I need to do more. Let me sign up for another event. Let me book another evening out. Great. I guess God just wants me to be really super busy doing a whole bunch of stuff and I'm exhausted. But 
It's good works, so let's get going to this. You've been saved for good works, and some of you here, okay, fine. I give in. I'll sign up for this ministry. I'll attend this Bible study. I'll, I'll do more. And we miss it. Church, my heart breaks for church cultures that produce that. You need to do more. You need to attend more. You need to, you need to be at the Tuesday night visitation, the Friday night activity, the Saturday work day, and somewhere in that you need to also find time to prep for the kids' Sunday school class on Sunday. Do, do more. And the way to get people to either do more is by guilting them into it or attracting them to it by making it the can't-miss activity of the month. The first way guilting them into it does nothing but drains the church body and leads to nothing more than exhausted, guilt-ridden, legalistic Christians. And the second way leads to nothing more than exhausted, performance-driven church staff trying to entice people to do more and be there more. And both ways don't have a complete view of what it means to do good works or how the good works even come about. So when we think good works, we often end up getting to a point where we think of good works and we think of this long list of things we do. Don't even bother reading the whole thing. It's not an exhaustive list, okay? That's why it keeps on going down. There's more words that you can't even see. Because we just have this list of good works and you begin thinking of all these physical things I should do. I should make a meal. I should disciple somebody. I need to share the gospel more. I need to teach somebody. I need to serve in the nursery. I need to write a note of encouragement. I need to mentor somebody. And you just run down these lists of things that you need to do. And then what happens is we simply think that serving God is things that we check off upon our schedule and if we're more spiritual, we put more things for God on our schedule and bump out a few of the secular things, quote unquote, in our schedule. This is incomplete. It doesn't understand where good works come from. Where does service actually happen from? See, see genuine good works flow out of a transformed heart. Matthew, 20, Matthew 12, 20, 25. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. Where's the sequence? Heart, transformed, brings out good stuff. Flip side, evil heart, evil stuff comes out. I mean, we see that in Proverbs over and over and over again. Proverbs 4. The heart, the wellspring of life, is what pours everything else out. That, that is why when Scripture goes to what fruit is, like the fruit of the Spirit is not, the fruit of the Spirit is not how many times you sign up for events at church. Galatians 5 does not finish with the fruit of the Spirit is teaching Sunday school class, giving out tracts and writing notes and making meals and, and every other thing that you can think of for godly service. The fruit of the Spirit goes to heart issues. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and patience and pa peace and gentleness and kindness and faithfulness and, and self-control. They're heart issues. So when we get to this statement, you were created for good works, if we simply say, I hear that, I got it, we need to go do more. We'll miss this. Because we'll simply be a bunch of individuals making ourselves perform to a certain standard that we think is right, even if we don't care about what we're doing or why we're doing it. And our obedience will be nothing more than the kid has been told to go clean their room and stomps down the hallway huffing and puffing and throwing toys around the room. But they're cleaning their room. If our simple action of saying do more is saying, okay, fine, what do you want me to do? How many times? Okay, I got it. We've missed it. Because true service for God always flows out of a heart that's been transformed by God. If I loved more, if I loved more, would I have to be told to serve more? It's just be what I do. 
It, if, I, if I had more self-control, to where I thought less of myself and more of others, would I just be different to my family? If I was more faithful with the ups and the downs and the ebbs of the flows of what I do for God, even out some. You see where this pushes us? You've been saved for good works. Yes, agree. For transformed life that lives for God. But the target of that is happening at the heart level. This is why the passage goes to the last phrase, so walk in them. Verse 10. Walk in them. This is just simply the life that you live. And that phrase, walk in them, is actually what you see show up in Galatians 5, where we're told to walk in the Spirit. It is simply life by life action. Your alarm clock rings tomorrow morning. I don't know when you have to get to work. Let's just say you, you're a nine o'clocker. Nine o'clock, can you show good works for God? They're like, well, pastor, I, I, can't, I can't. It's not Sunday anymore. I haven't, I haven't served over here and here and here. I've got to wait till the next day where I can do more good works for God when I get back to church. No. You walk in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. And what transforms in your life is a life that pours out God's love as you serve him wherever you are doing whatever you're doing. You're transformed. Now, this is where it's hard. I think this is where we mess up so often. As a pastor, it is far easier for me to tell you, application, do good works. All right, we got a sign-up sheet on the welcome desk. We need 17 people on that side. We have a work day on Saturday. Sign up. You can solve all our problems, and you can, you can accomplish this sermon if you give me two hours on Saturday. We're all like, yes, check it off. What else do I need to do next? I mean, this is how it also is with our marriages. Okay, just tell me how to solve this. Yes. Two-hour date night Friday, you're all good. How do I need to be a better parent? Yep, you just need five minutes once a night praying with your kids, you're good. Application's far easier if you just tell me what do I need to do. Give me the step-by-step approach and we'll accomplish it. But that's not real spiritual change. And if you bear with me, that is not exactly what God saved me for. God saved me to transform my heart to make me brand new so that the fruit in my life would naturally grow to be love. To be service. To be pour out my life for others. But heart change, well, heart change, that's hard. I mean, heart change how do I accomplish that by Friday, Pastor? You, you, you don't. See, heart change happens day by day by day as I live in Christ. Change happens as I am in Christ. A relationship with Christ. I love how one individual said it this week I was reading. Change is the byproduct of being known and loved by Jesus, our Redeemer. Change is not accomplished by mastering a technique or following a system. It takes place as we are in relationship with Christ and him alone. This is why John 15 tells us, okay, wait a minute. Abide in Christ and you'll produce much fruit. It does not say, here's a long checklist of things you need to accomplish this week to be spiritual. It simply says, abide in Christ. Be in him. Run to him. Walk with him. Rest in him. Pray to him. Live with him. And see him transform your heart day by day to where what happens in your life begins to change as you look different and you're being transformed. But we want quick fixes. We're the generation that wants to lose all the weight we put on from bad eating for the last decade and seven weeks before Christmas. We're the generation 
We're the generation in the world right now that wants to ignore all due dates of a semester and classwork for the first 15 weeks of the semester and then show up to the professor and say, how can I actually make my grade an A in the last five days? We want the quick fix. We want it spiritually too. Pastor, I've ran roughshod in my life. I ran roughshod in my marriage. I've kind of backslidden spiritually. What can I do this week to fix it all? Just tell me what to do more. No, no, run to Christ. Do that tomorrow and the next day 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 and the next day. And you say, that sounds like hard work. It is. But Christian, that is what you have been saved for. That is why God redeemed you. That is why God gave his son for you. That your life would be transformed to glorify him by how you live. You're his workmanship. A few years ago, I was, I was in China. One of the days I was in there, we walked through the market. It was like sensory overload in China market. Different tastes, smells, different booths. I ate, I ate soup dumplings. That was worth the plane ticket right there. I'd go back for those things. You take a little bite of the dumpling, you suck out soup that somehow magically got inside the dumpling, and then you bite into the beef stew or whatever's in the inside. I, I walked around watching individuals do the, the, the Chinese letters with their fancy pens, and they write down scripts, and you could say what you want them to say, and then they'd write out the word you wanted. You'd have no idea if it was right or not, um, so I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't go to that booth. There was one booth I went to. It was an artist. And if you've seen Chinese art, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a, it was a, he was making black and white landscapes. Mountain scenes with little brooks or valleys with rivers in the bottom. And they're really pretty. I never realized how they made them, though. Those paintings are made by hand. There are no brushes. He would take his finger and literally just smudge things on the, on the paper. If it was on his hand, his fingernails, his fingers, his arm, his elbow, he would make an entire landscape of mountains. I have a small little picture in my office. Just remind me of it. But as I stood back and watched this guy, he was just engrossed in this, this little piece of paper with some black smudging paint going over a, a, a canvas. And as you watched, it took shape. There's mountains there. He'd move a fingernail and kind of sketch out a little path down there. He'd rub a finger over here and you'd get a little river down here. And he was making his handiwork. It was planned and thought out. There was design. To where in the end, it would all be put together and you would see this really amazing work of art. Christian, you are God's handiwork. It's a work that he's been at from eternity past. It's a work that started as he planned salvation because he knew mankind would rebel against him. It's a work of art that is sacrificed greatly for. In fact, it's, it's a handiwork that has cost him his own son's life. It's a handiwork that he's been at for thousands upon thousands of years of creation. To redeem you, to form you, to make you a new child transformed. And it's all working towards something. Towards a purpose. Not so that we can go home and kick back and say, wow, that's great. Someday I'll be in heaven. Amen. Not so we can say, wow, God, thank you. That's nice to have that in the back pocket. I get to go live my life. You know, all the smudging, all the marks, all the planning, all the design has a purpose. And you have been made brand new to glorify your God as you serve him through a transformed life. How are we doing on the purpose? What you are is handiwork. But are you actually functioning the way God created you to function? Are you living out the purpose God has in you.
Let's pray. And so, God, I say thank you for your word. And I say thank you for your purpose. We do this week after week. We do it fittingly because we're supposed to respond. God's word is changing us. And so let's take the moment and respond. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Is that grace that you know? Or are you still fighting against that grace with yeah, but moments where you want to bring in what you've done to help God out? Individual here today, your work will never, will never pay off the debt of your sin. And so my plead for you today would be that you would see the payment that's complete in Jesus Christ on the cross. And that you would receive that payment as your only hope. You can do that right now. You can pray right now. Turn from sin, believe in Jesus Christ. I can set you up with somebody to talk with today. But then Christian, all that that God has done in your life, it's for a reason. It's for a purpose. Father, we don't pray because of anything we've accomplished. We don't pray to you because of who we have been this past week. We pray because of what you have done in our lives. What you have accomplished, what you have made us by your grace. So we pray because we thank you for it. We pray because we desperately need that grace working in our lives over and over again. To be transformed for the good work that you have made us for. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. We're going to celebrate the truth we just wrestled with in God's word. Would you stand? The song is complete in thee. Musicians can come. Vocalists can come. They help us in praising God for what he has done in our life through Jesus Christ. In your hymnals, hymn number 112, Complete in Thee. Hymn number 112, Complete in Thee, no work of mine may take, dear Lord, the place of thine. Lift your voices together, rejoicing in what Christ has done.
ask you to be seated, if you would, please. We just want to give a few reminders regarding uh, announcements of things coming up here. We're not done here this morning. We have a time of fellowship, our ABF time. Worship folks, you can sit down as well. Um, we have our ABF time uh, coming up after this service at uh, 1045 or so, uh, give or take. And uh, classrooms over here for some of the adults. There's a classroom over here uh, for, for another adult class as well. Um, on Sunday evenings, we are continuing a series regarding avoiding ditches. And uh, so just uh, some helpful tools for us, things to think about regarding issues of our time that uh, churches have faced and that have uh, even caused division within churches, and we want to address a few of those things. And then coming up here uh, in a few weeks, we have our Good Friday service, some platforms for us to present the gospel. And uh, on Good Friday, at, uh, on April 15th, we'll have a service here at 2 o'clock. And uh, you are invited to that. You're invited to, in, to bring friends uh, to that time. It'll be a lot of, of scripture reading and music and uh, meditating on the death of Christ. And then on April 17th is Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday, as we call it. That is a full day for us. So we're encouraging you to be a part of the whole time that we have together here, okay? Don't just choose one aspect and say, oh, I'm just going to come to that, okay? Come to the whole thing. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a time for us to gather kind of early, a little earlier than what we normally would. We're going to gather here at 7 o'clock. Now, we're going to call it a sunrise service. We all know the sun rises before 7, right? But we're going to call it a sunrise service. It's an early service, a special time for us to remember um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then we're going to gather and invite the community and, and everyone who wants to join us for a special time of breakfast that we'll be having there at 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock breakfast. And then at 9 o'clock, we'll have our, our, our resurrection, our normal worship service for Resurrection Sunday. And so we want you to kind of include all of those elements in your day. And we'll be done for the day at that point. So 7 o'clock, uh, early service, 8 o'clock for the breakfast, 9 o'clock for our, our regular morning service, and then we'll be done for the day, and you can spend uh, some special time with family after that. I'm going to invite Tim Stepanski, one of the chairman of our deacon board, to come. He has a special presentation uh, for us this morning. Well, good morning. We are blessed, aren't we? Our church, we are blessed to have a pastor who is dedicated to God's word. And I don't know if you've known this, but over the past two years, he's been working very hard at something. He's been, he's accomplished something very significant that we as deacons have felt that would be very important that we celebrate. Over the past two years, the pastor has put in an awful lot of effort and you may have seen it, he mentioned it two weeks ago from the pulpit. You may have seen um, some of his Facebook posts, but over the past two years, the pastor has lost about 45 pounds and we felt that as a deacon board that we should honor that. So pastor, could you please come up? So we have a few gifts that we thought just to help celebrate. This is an awful lot of hard work for him. So he's changed his eating style, what he, what he puts into his body. Uh, as much as we try to push him in other directions, he won't go there. So we, we want to support that. So we have a bag of granola for him. So here's a bag of granola. And then still we want to push a little bit and, and let him realize that there is times that he can reward himself. And he mentions these from the pulpit a lot too. A jar of peanut M&Ms for him to share. Now I mentioned we're blessed as a church and we're blessed not just because of the pastor but also his family. Over the past two years he's accomplished something as a family. So Marcia, if you and the kids, I know this is a surprise to you but I'd like for you to come join us on stage. Over the past more than two years, Pastor and his family have accomplished something together. Now, I remember 
Luke Love, way back. When we first moved into this building, he taught a Sunday school class, and I sat right in my seat that I've been sitting in now for 15 years, and he taught through the Book of Romans. And I remember thinking to myself then, wow, he's a talented young kid, which he was a young kid. He left as he graduated, went on to um, his first job, married, had her first child, then decided he wanted to do more education. He didn't go the normal path of education, 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 finish all that, get your job, then have a family. He decided to mix things up a little bit. Then he went on for follow-on education, got his second job. Went on for more education, had more kids, went on for his third job. Came here, had more kids. Went on and decided, I want to complete my education. And when I say we're blessed, we're blessed because we can now call him Dr. Love. And we're blessed because we're going to take all that education that he has and it's going to be imparted on us. All of his education and God's word. But we're also blessed because we got to see a family that supported him through all of this. This was not an event he did just by himself. So we're going to give you a couple of gifts. They say Dr. Love on them, which is sufficient. Or, or, or it's not sufficient, but it's, it's the right name right now to call. He wouldn't let us use that name. I wanted to put it out on the sign. He said no. I thought it would be great if we had a parade down Main Street today. Pastor Caleb said no. So we're going to do this. In this gift, first off, kids, there's plenty enough in this that you guys deserve and have earned a trip to Jumbles, okay? And when you go to Jumbles, it's not a single scoop you're getting. You get a triple, and if your dad says no, tell him, Mr. Stepanski, please. <laughs> Marsha, the majority of this gift is for you because you've raised the kids and still supported your husband, even when you'd be tired, crabby, and still have to put together a sermon for us. So this gift, there's plenty in here for you to be taken away for a couple days and be treated well, have real nice dinners, go up to Door County as it's starting to get nice, and make him go into all the little arts and craft stores and enjoy them. Uh, pastor in here, after they're done getting with their rewards, there's enough for you to get a tank of gas. Um, there's no woodworking tools that come out of this, but there's also a coupon in here for a free brisket, redeemable at your time, uh, for when you have all your family together. But we are blessed to have this family to watch God's grace played out as we now have Dr. Love on stage. And if I can, I'd like to call Johnny up. Johnny knows him longer than I've known him. So we're going to have Johnny come up and pray for this family and as a continued blessing for us in the church. And then when we're done here, we're going to sing another song before we go, but we also have some things to help encourage his diet. We've got wonderful cupcakes out there. He can, have a, he can have a granola bar, or excuse me, donuts. We've got plenty of things to help celebrate uh, today's event. So, Johnny? You got me crying, though. <laughs> I can't believe I made it without crying. <laughs> it's been my privilege, sir, to known you guys for going on 20 years. I remember Marcia coming over to the house and you didn't like my TV and things like that. I liked NASCAR and he didn't. And I didn't know that, but he was, he watched it. But it's been an honor to have known you for all these 20 years. And I was excited when I found out that you were going to be our pastor here. Um, we've gone through a lot and you've guided us. And I'm so thankful for that. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we just praise you for your goodness to us. We just praise you for being in charge and being in control of our lives. And through all the ups and downs, Lord, you've been there and you're guiding us. We come to you now, Lord, and we lift up this family. Lord, we pray that your wisdom will guide him every step. We pray that you protect them. And Lord, we pray for our
pastoral staff, Lord, as they guide us as our shepherds. And we pray for us as the flock that we would uphold them in prayer and pray for them daily for protections and wisdom and guidance. We pray for us as we love and help one another in difficult times and lift up each other. Help us to be the lighthouse in this area that we need to be. And Lord, we give you all the praise and glory and we thank you for all that you've done for us and will continue to do for us and we look to you for the future. Lord, we thank you again in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, I... Um, want to clarify, I know a lot of you guys have teased me. Do I call you doctor now? Tim just did. I want you to just church know. Um, the word pastor to me means far more than any academic title that can be placed upon a word, a name. Um, I said this seven years ago when I began because you guys knew me before I even arrived and some people said, I call you Luke for so long and I got to change your name now. Um, my name's still Luke. And to me, pastor means far more because pastor says shepherd. Pastor says character requirements in the Bible must be maintained. Pastor says love and care. And, and that is why I actually went to continue education as I did because I want to take what God has given into my life and use it to the abilities that God has given to me as faithfully as I can for as long as I can. I went for more school so I could do what I did today and do it in a way that could glorify God more and more. And that is my burden. That we have God's word and we need God's word in our life as a church. And so thank you for the opportunity to do it. My wife's been thanked. You don't understand what it means for her husband to go through a doctorate, which means she's had to read hundreds of pages of my writing and then edit it and change it and make it sound better. And then for me to come back and say, I messed up, I gotta write two more chapters all over again. So you need to do it all over again. And so it's right, and I thank you for thanking my whole family in that. God bless. Let's stand together as we close this morning. The Lord is my salvation, rejoicing again in what God has done. The Lord is my salvation.
righteousness. 